so how many different kinds of food do you guys grow at Mosby Farms? Oh, that's dwindling, actually, really? over the years. Yeah, sure. We don't grow no green beans, no peas anymore. It's too labor intensive. So we are currently down to rhubarb, leeks, beets, zucchini, yellow squash, some hard squashes, pumpkins for fall, sweet corn that we um, sell for pumpkin patch. We don't have we don't have our retail stand anymore either, mm. uh, thanks to some regulatory requirements from King County. Mm. If we were going to stay open, we would have had to put in a well and um, a water treatment system. And for a, a part-time stand, it's like, uh, no thanks. So uh, we don't grow some of those odds and end items that end up in a store too. So, so yeah, we're just down to the things that we wholesale to mostly um, every grocery chain and produce house in the Pacific Northwest. And that's because that was going to be my next question. Where can you find all of this food? Like yeah. How? Grocery store. If I live in Seattle, restaurants. how do I know if I'm getting something from Mosby Farms? Yeah, you should ask for it every single time. Huh? <laughs> yeah. That's um, a good idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of fun because you do get photos from your friends that are like, hey, look, I found some beets in, in the grocery store in some random town, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, not even remotely close to us, and it'll have a, a tie on it. And uh, so that's kind of cool to get those. Um, you know, we sell to Charlie's Produce, and and they have contracts with the cruise ships, and so, like, right now, that's not happening, right? Mm, so, yeah. um, and then restaurants and and pretty much all of the players in the Pacific Northwest we sell to. So if it's not in a grocery store, it's in a restaurant. So if it's in a grocery store, is it gonna like have your sticker on it or something? Yeah, it'll have a tie or a sticker. Not not always, it depends. It depends, like rhubarb's not a stickered item. It, it's kind of comical because huh. I'm a consumer myself, right? right. And so uh, sometimes I'll roll through the produce department and and I'll notice that the rhubarb will say it's from Mexico, and I'll say to the produce guy, hey, so rhubarb doesn't grow in Mexico, so why is it tagged that it's in Mexico? And they're like, well, and I'm like, no, no, you can't get away with telling me that it's, you know, legit, because yeah. it's not. We grow yeah. rhubarb. And so it's um, interesting to go through the produce section and just see, like, what – either your product looks like or what your uh, fellow growers product looks like and how they how the store is marketing that product and and uh, yeah I don't know it is what it is you know <laughs> we're just trying to survive well it, that's a thing though like the labeling and the stickers and stuff like you say some things can have stickers on it some things aren't going to but a lot of people like myself are trying to when to go to the store buy as many local things as they can realizing that it's not going to be possible with everything but it's hard to know sometimes like you how to ask. know you should ask and and the reason you ask is because oh boy we're going to dive in deep yeah. right in the beginning yeah, do it. Uh, the reason you should ask is because um the the produce buyer in cincinnati his job is to get produce in his store for the lowest price possible, yeah. right? And he, I don't believe, really gives a rip what is happening in Auburn, Washington mm. on Mosby's vegetable farm. Mm -hmm. Like, he likes that we're here, and he likes that that somewhere in a store um, there's a poster hanging with our faces and our names on it and claiming that we're a local grower. But at the same time, like, that's not his job. His job is to get product in the store for the lowest price because he's trying to give the consumer the lowest price. But wait a second. Like, at the same time, there's a difference between staying afloat and thriving for the farmer. Yeah. And so if you're staying afloat year after year after year and you're scraping, like, you're rubbing your nickels together, <laughs> but that doesn't turn into a dollar anywhere, right? And so... Yeah. We still are using equipment. We're still um, using trucks. We're still, you know, having to maintain those things and still think about going forward. How are we going to invest in better irrigation that's more efficient, 
better equipment that's more efficient uh whose trucks are we buying that are second hand right because we're a first generation farm so no previous generation paid for anything right. where we are and so when you think about the difference between staying afloat and thriving the thriving part ensures that we can invest in the future right right so we live in washington we, our farm is 40 minutes from Microsoft. I mean, you think about what is happening in the tech world and how we can how we can tie that into agriculture. And and we've had people out measuring our equipment because they want to know like how far apart the cultivators are and and um, those little details because I'm sure they're working on robotics. Right. Okay. So say they achieve those goals, they have this great piece of equipment. Well, what farmer that is staying afloat? is going to be able to actually invest in those tools to make their job more efficient. <laughs> right. But yet the consumer expects us to be more quote sustainable mm -hmm. and and try to make those moves. But if we're still staying afloat like barely, mm -hmm. how do we how do we do that? How do you invest um, for the future? And so so that's that's really um, I think up to the customer, the consumer, to be saying at the grocery store, hey, I want to buy what's in season and what's local. Help me, tell me what that is. So you're saying people actually asking that question at the store, what, what if it's just some young guy working there and doesn't know anything? Is it, does it still make a difference if you ask those questions? Well, it sure doesn't make the produce guy look very smart that he doesn't know. Yeah. And... I think um, I think as consumers, that should be our expectation: is that our our produce guys should be able to answer those questions. And uh, he might come back with an "I don't know." Like I ask, I'll go, I'll go to a grocery store, I'll go to some really higher end grocery stores because they have better cheese, and I really love cheese. And um, I'll walk through the produce section and I'll say, "Hey, where's your rhubarb from?" Or, "Hey, where's your zucchini from? Do you still have your box?" You know, and and sometimes I'll go in the back and they'll say, "Yeah, I don't have the box." And sometimes they come out with ours. Sometimes they come out with Richter's. Sometimes they come out with Storino's or whatever. I I don't care. Like I just I like to know that it's that it's a locally sourced product and and that our regional farmers are being supported. Does that signal kind of go back up the chain? chain though if i ask at the grocery store can that so i hope so have you ever heard back from like yeah people were asking for local stuff or your mosby farm stuff or anything like that <laughs> i haven't heard that directly but i do believe that the marketing you hear on the radio is a result or the the marketing you see in a newspaper or what have mm. you is is those grocery chains trying to appeal to consumer demands, mm. right? So we have conventional on our farm, we have organic on our farm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're switching slowly to organic because that's where the market is going. Right. And for us on our farm, like I, I would say that doesn't apply to every aspect of agriculture, um, but for us, it's like motorboats and sailboats and or bicycles and <laughs> motorcycles right yeah. so for us like i keep coming back to rhubarb but rhubarb is a great example like rhubarb grows it doesn't um for us it does there's not really much you apply to rhubarb on a conventional end or organic end and the organic rhubarb actually is ready two weeks before the conventional rhubarb and we can mm -hmm. sell it as conventional if it's organic and so for us rhubarb is rhubarb right. you know whether it's certified or not um People are always going to pay more for designer cheese and designer wine and designer shoes. And, and yeah. if you go those extra steps to get that certification and people are willing to pay for it, you know, there's a market there. Yeah. And so um, if retailers start saying that that should be your only choice, that's wrong. You know what mm. I mean? So I think I think we're lucky to live where we live and have choices that's a beautiful part of living where we live mm -hmm. is having food choices um so i think my my issue to a point with the marketing part of that is that i think they kind of they kind of steer that boat a little bit 
you know, like, hey, you need this because it has this label or you need this because it was raised this way or you need, you know, and at the end of the day, I think if consumers really want to send the message that local agriculture is important and that I want to support what's, you know, what is grown here, they need to be saying that to their produce person because it should be getting back to that department manager yeah. who should be relaying that to their buyer. And and honestly, the reason I often don't think to do something like that is because I'm cynical. I think nobody's going to care. But maybe sometimes it will actually work. I uh, don't know. Or, or can we, is there any other mechanism to kind of help push this local food movement along and and get the market more aware of those of us who want local food, our, our demand, our you know, right. desire to have local, local grown stuff? Well, honestly, like if I did an at Kroger, Safeway, whatever, right, I'm probably going to get cut off as a farmer, but a consumer could do that all day long, you know, when it comes to social media. So like yeah. a, a Twitter tag or a social media post tagging those companies, I think that I think social media, especially when it comes to agriculture, is underutilized. And um, I think I'd, you know, as a grower, I don't know that that's the right direction for us because we're depending on on those companies for sales, you know. Mm -hmm. But a consumer, they have nothing to lose in, in demanding that local agriculture is supported. Because when you think about... Um, the carbon footprint of something that is grown at our farm and we deliver it 15 miles to the distribution center in Puyallup and then we deliver it seven miles to the distribution center in Auburn and then we deliver 25 minutes to Seattle like that's a very low carbon footprint yeah Right. Compared to grown overseas or in Central or South America or California, like yeah, to travel you know. hundreds or more likely thousands of miles. Right. To get to Seattle. And we're growing 350 acres of hand weeded, hand harvested produce. And so. Uh, out of that or or we're, we're stewarding 500 acres. And so that mm. 350 acres is under production, but the other acreage is yeah. either forestry buffers next to the green river or um a little bit next to the white river or in ording uh, i think there's i don't think we're next to anything in ording really but um or it's in cover crops or you know we're trying to build soil so that i don't think i don't think people realize that that just because that acreage is there doesn't mean that we're planting every little bit of it like you know there mm. is this rotation plan and there is um a conscious effort to invest into the soil for the future because it's all we got. Is it too much of a stretch then to say that if I go to the store and say, no, I like, is this locally grown? Can you guys get locally grown in? Uh, can you, you know, bring more stuff into the store that that is grown locally and that creates some sort of signal of demand up the chain maybe i post some things on social media and at them mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever it takes and they start increasing or realizing there's an increasing demand for locally grown food that in turn helps support you and other local growers which helps keep local farmland in production right totally and yeah. and not just all of it in production but then in rotation or you farms to be able to be here that's actually by asking that question and buying making that purchase at the store i'm helping the rivers and the fish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here is that too much of a stretch to say that no i don't think so and as long as they're um having as long as they're thriving you've just summed up sustainability right mm -hmm. so so we're employing I think I signed 81 paychecks last week, and that's 81 families that, that we're help, helping to put food on the table for. And, and so, you know, at the end of the season, when we, you know, write that check to the bank and, you know, attempt to pay everything back, right, 
Um, if there's a little bit left, then we've accomplished our goals. We've created something that we can invest back into the farm and we've um, helped out our employees have, have a roof over their head and food in their bellies. And we've provided food for our community. And that, that also includes food that is donated to local food banks. Because when you have, when you have boxes of zucchini in your cooler and you have sold so many, but you have this little bit of extra, and you know we could dump them in the dump truck to go to the compost pile over the bridge at Arnie's for Arnie's cows, mm-hmm. or we can um, send it to the food bank and feed people. That's a straight up donation. That is a loss of box, which the box is like a buck seventy five each, mm. and that's a loss of labor. And so, you know. Um, you take this farm out of a community equation and it's a loss. It's a loss of land yeah. stewardship. It's a loss of community impact when it comes to feeding people who are having um, food access issues. And it's a loss to paychecks for 81 families. And I think it's a loss to, like I was thinking about, the river system and, and water and fish and habitat. Mm-hmm. here too because what i mean what happens to this valley that you're in you're so close to the city mm-hmm. if you go away what happens to it yeah well that's up to the next owner i guess it would be huh i mean i would think it would houses come in here pavement no, development no that's the one thing about um that you have to give king county credit for so this is fpp land so mm-hmm. uh this has had the development rights purchased Mm -hmm. and so it will always be farmland so it's been preserved so that happened before we got here so everybody else yeah like this piece um the previous owner benefited from that the main warehouse piece is a different piece and uh that was shelter dairy at one time and uh they benefited from from that development right purchase but no this will always be it'll always be farmland so, but is that just your farm? What about the area around it? How much of this area is protected? Quite a bit of the Green River Valley. This is a uh, agricultural production zone, and so King County has worked hard to um, protect its ag zones. And so this whole Green River Valley, which used to have hops in it, and then it's had strawberry farms, mm-hmm. and and uh, now mostly cattle. Uh, there's a blueberry farm up the road, and then, and then there's us. So we we didn't come here until, I think Burr bought the main warehouse piece around 1990. Mm. So, so that's kind of when the farm started, or was he no, farming before then? No, you'll have to you'll have to hit him up for yeah. the podcast because he has a he's a great story in himself. He um, so he was 14 when he uh, started doing hay in the Ording Valley. And his dad was a pharmacist who left the family farm when his dad would not upgrade uh, the mules, whose names were Tom and Jerry, uh, <laughs> to a tractor. And, wow. um, but he always loved equipment. And so he was a pharmacist and his mom grew up on a holly farm up kind of where the second runway of SeaTac is. Mm. And then they moved out um, McMillan, which is this tiny little town that doesn't really exist anymore, kind mm. of on your way out to Ording. And he and his brother started baling hay. And then um, mentors are awesome people, right? And so he had a mentor. Her name is Italia Ciampa. Her um, maiden name was Vaca. And so she, we always call her Mrs. Vaca. And she's, she's still alive. I think she's right about 99 years old at this wow. point. And uh, she said, hey, Burr, you should be growing, you know, uh, zucchini and leeks. And, and so he kind of delved into that. And he, at 17, so think about that, he's still in high school, uh, made his first delivery of acorn squash in the back of a pickup truck to Safeway in like 1977. That's awesome. Yeah, which would never happen today. I mean, today you have, yeah. you know, food safety craziness right Mm -hmm. and you have to deliver it in a refrigerated truck and it gets temperature checked and you have to have a the little tab that um the temp trail 
you know, that goes on your palate and it tells you the temperature, the whole really? route of, yeah, from, you know, you have to make sure it didn't like get too warm on delivery. And wow. so anyway, so I have huge admiration. His brother went on to um, work at Sumner Tractor and then bought into Sumner Tractor and kind of went that route. But Burr really um, just kept going on the farm and turned it into what it is now. And so I have huge respect for the guy that works harder than anybody I know. When did you join the picture? Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I missed all the late nights of headlights on the tractor until midnight um, and eating lettuce out of the field because it's all, you know, you can afford. Uh, wow. I came along later. So um, let's see, we uh, grew up, actually I grew up two miles up the road from Burr. We're about 14 mm. years, well, we are 14 years to the day because we share a birthday. Uh, oh. We're 14 years apart. And um, my older brother went to school with his younger sister. And our circles kind of touched. We knew a lot of the same people. Sumner's a mm. small town. Uh, but we didn't really know each other. Uh, I worked at the local pharmacy. He would come in. I always thought he looked like Tom Selleck because he had this, you know, big mustache and dark hair. And <laughs> it was dark. Now he's all grayed out. But anyhow, um, and he looked right through me. Talked to the pharmacist in the back, and and we had some friends, mutual friends, that got married. So one of my really good friends from school got married to a local turf farmer, and um, so we chatted. I think the first time there. And but I was there with a boyfriend and ended up <laughs> marrying that boyfriend. And um, but we would run into each other for probably 13 years at weddings because yeah. I have relatives that are farmers <laughs> in the Sumner Valley. Weddings, funerals, and McClendon Hardware, which is just <laughs> weird. And and so we talked to each other. So that still happens, and it's not even that far from the big city. But those meetings where there's community around things like a hardware store. Yeah. Oh, I love totally. That. Totally. Love that. And I love the hardware store. I had a, a decorative painting and plastering business. Um, so I've, I've always worked in a man's world, I guess. <laughs> and um, I, uh, backing up a little bit, I, my little brother played football in high school and then um, ended up at Western playing football. Mm. And in that time, my dad got cancer. And um, so I, went to school locally and never went off to college. It's like I was the only girl, I was the middle girl, I'm gonna stay and help my mom. And and um, the priority was my little brother because he had this great opportunity, right? So my dad passed when I was 20. And so here's my mom, she worked for the sheriff's department and we had cows and you know, she's up and trying to feed these cows at four o'clock in the morning so she can go to work and I'm going to school and it was just, it was just chaotic. So um, that's about the time that I had talked to Burr at that wedding. And um, anyhow, so, so just different. I just kind of had this path where I ended up uh, getting married, had a couple kids, um, eventually started my decorative painting and plastering business. Um, ended up divorced mm -hmm. and so chapter one chapter two situation yeah. right yeah. and uh i would go to this coffee shop early in the morning and burr's foreman worked there and um or his mechanic guy one of his foremen and i was there for my 30th birthday and i was like hey i go you guys i'm and i was you know, it was like not a time in my life to have a party. <laughs> and I said, hey, I'm so glad you guys are here. You know, hey, happy birthday. You know, it was my birthday today, my 30th. It's a milestone. And Boyd said, today's your birthday? Today's Burr's birthday. So here I knew for 13 years, Burr, like we would have right. these 20-minute conversations in the middle of McClendon hardware <laughs> and um, never knew that we shared a birthday. And so anyhow... He just called me up one day and and I mean there were a few other like weird coincidental things that happened in there that made him call me up one day and he said, Hey, you wanna go have dinner? And I was like, sure, why not? Like a man in my life at that point was not on my list either. Cause here <laughs> I am, I'm I'm self employed, I've got two kids, you know what yeah. I mean? And and it was just one of those weird 
times in your life where you're thinking, I do not have time for this, right? right. I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning trowels and brushes at 11 o'clock at night and trying to do bids and get my sample boards done. And, ah, uh, but, um, it, it was, uh, Burr was an easy relationship for me. It was like, it was almost like going home, you know, cause we we're both from Sumner. We knew a lot of the same people. We just, our conversations were great. And, and, um, when I left my parents, I was like, oh, I'll never have to put hay in a barn again, you know? And <laughs> Little did you know. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I still don't have to put yeah, hay yeah, in a barn, but um, I move bales for pumpkin patch every year, but I, <laughs> I, can, I can handle that. Like, but, uh, yeah, it, it um, had a, an uncle who had a tremendous garden, and he would always try to give me leeks, and I'd say, Uncle Gil, I don't know what to do with the leeks. Can I have some grapes off your grapevines, you know? And and so then I end up marrying a leek farmer, and I have so many leek recipes, it's not even <laughs> funny. So anyhow, uh, yeah, so I came along, um, so yeah, I was about 30, 31, so that's 17 years ago. And um, I think because uh, of just having a taste, you know, my dad was more of, definitely more of a gentleman farmer. He mm. worked in construction and was a foreman, and so he handled big project kind of stuff. Um, I just have respect for the industry and respect for the process and respect for what happens here. And then yeah. I think he appreciates that. It's like he gets home when he gets home, and he's the first guy to go to work. And, well, except for during zucchini season, those guys show up at 5 in the morning and <laughs> but he's always the last one to come home. I took a picture from our house of the warehouse last week and the office lights were on and everything was dark. And here he is volunteering his time because he's the um, chair of the King Conservation Board of Supervisors. And I'm like, so here's this guy who's worked his ass off all day and he's sitting there, hopefully, drinking a beer while he's doing this <laughs> yeah. meeting, right? Yeah. But sitting there trying to take care of something that is all volunteer hours. Mm. And I think that's another thing that people don't always realize is the amount of volunteer time that, that farmers contribute, you know, mm. to agriculture issues. Like they sit on boards about water issues or they, yeah. you know. So, yeah, I have huge, uh, there's my Burr Mosby yeah. plug. So uh, how did you get into the actual farming part of it though. Like how did that go? Because you had, I guess you had some kind of farming experience, but you hadn't done farming like this. Right, cause I had my own business, so. And you're yeah. kind of an artist, right? It sounds like with so, your So yeah, I, so what, what happened is we, um, so we got married and I was uh, running my own business and um, doing well at it. I mean, I did it for 13 years and, um, I liked it. I had lots of flexibility. And so Burr says, Hey, so the gal who's going to run our farm stand, isn't going to come back. And so will you run it? And I was like, no, hire somebody like I have a job. I like my job No. Yeah. And He's like, oh, come on. I'm like, dude, I want to be married to you 10 years from now. Like, we have very <laughs> different styles when it comes to, like, leadership and working. And yeah, yeah. Like, I, no, I'm not going to work for you or with you. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, total fail in that statement. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, so I said, okay, fine, because he's, he's really good at procrastinating. And, and I said, okay, fine. I have a business, and so here I am, business, I have two kids, right, who are already, like, in school, because mm -hmm. I have two older kids, and then I have this new baby, and I'm trying to run this business, and uh, I said, I will run your farm stand. I will not stand behind the till. I will hire, I will fire. I will do your produce order. Um, I'll count your tills down. Like I'll make sure that things are done, but I am not. I'm not going to be there 24/7. Like, you know. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> so there was a day uh, in particular that my um, babysitter fell through for Lily, number three, 
and out of four. And I'm on a ladder in a Forza coffee shop, which was one of my uh, uh, commercial clients. And uh, I'm moving glaze on a wall, and my phone is in the crook of my neck, and I'm making a produce order, and I got a screaming kid in a stroller. And I'm like, <laughs> what the F am I doing with my life right now? Like, seriously, like, why am I, why, why, why? Right? Yeah. And so I made, I made a really, like, it was a hard decision for me, but I, um, I chose to uh, give up my business, which was probably better for my shoulder anyway. Eventually, I did have to have surgery, mm. you know. But um, and the farm became the priority. It was better for my family, and we eat lunch together most days, you know. And so I jumped into the produce stand end of the farm, and. Burr was so happy because I increased sales 50% the first year. And then he's like, oh, hey. And so he took me to Italy and thinking we'd get pregnant with Henry and actually went to Italy six months pregnant with Henry. So whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, and he's, you know, trying to talk me into doing it again. And I was like, oh. And uh, so I, I did it until about six years ago. And, mm. and it grew a ton. Like we, you know, but you... 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. And that was the, that was like their missing link. The gal that was there before. It's like, if you're going to make a stir fry, you have to buy peppers. You know, people are coming through like, you know, we may not grow them, but you need to supply them. People right. will buy peppers. And cause they just want to go to one place. They want to have to go to five places to yeah. put their stir fry together. Yeah. And so, I mean, I started carrying wine and beer and cheese and, meat and doing borrow a basket where people could borrow this basket and then they could you know buy like a little picnic and go out and there was a tablecloth and a deck of cards or a little tiny backgammon and a little book for comments and two wine glasses and a cutting board like and people would spend money buying their snacks enjoying a space on the farm and then they'd come back through buy what they ate again because they thought it was so good the first time they have to take some home and then <laughs> they would leave i mean and it was like because i put a basket together and so i think i think what i bring to the farm is burr's very uh linear thinking and concrete and i'm like all over the place you know so i'm definitely more abstract and yeah. and so when it came to the retail end it was like no let's do this and let's do that and unfortunately for me sometimes i'm like let's do this and i say it and then i have to own it right you say yeah. it you own it yeah so definitely i'm then i'm like oh wait whose idea was this <laughs> i think it was mine oh no why did i say it out loud yeah. so i've had a few moments like that along the way how I got into the um, more of the advocacy end was because the labor issue became a bigger, more profound um, problem for our farm. And so uh, we started becoming much more vocal about, wow, this is really a problem. And wow, we're in, we're in South King County where there's plenty of people and we still can't get people to come to work. And so we, um, it, that just became my, my drum to beat. And uh, that's kind of how I got more involved in the, in the speaking out and the advocacy part of the farm. And so, so Burr's like the, the guy who's trying to do the day-to-day -day stuff. And I try to fill in on all of the retail end and the community outreach. And I'm typically the one who sits on boards and, you know, yeah. the, I'm the communicator. The communicator. He's, he's a good communicator too. He just doesn't have the time. Yeah. So. Lots of farming to do when you have 300 acres in production. Yeah. How would you describe the size of your farm? Like what category does <laughs> that fit into? So, well, if you ask people in King County, we're probably the big evil entity in, in the really? county. Well, I think so a little bit. Like we're... We're, um, there's a bigger farm. Uh, I'd say we're one of the bigger farms in King County, uh, but scale wise in the real world, we're small. Um, 
I'm just surprised that people don't like because you're growing local food here, basically in Seattle's backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and that, people that's are like frowned on because you're too big. Well, I think amongst, uh, I think there's the element of either agri other agriculturalists or um, consumers who really like that super small CSA style farm that get a little bit judgy, you know, but. Um, That's too bad because those are great too, but oh. we can't, especially afford it. And, you know, I'm saying this as somebody who's oh, yeah. not made of money. I can't always afford the, the high end, mm -hmm. you know, super small mm -hmm. farm stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's really cool that people are doing that and that people, some people can afford that. I can't always afford that. And I want just local food. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I just want to know it's grown close by. Yeah. And I think I think that's something, too, that usually goes unrecognized is that all aspects of agriculture have value. Um, when you think about the biggest restaurant in your town, it's likely your school district. And people mm. don't always think about it like that, right? Yep. And so you, if your school district is your biggest restaurant in town, you know, think about the hotels, the convention centers, you know, hospitals, those kinds of things. Those um, buyers or chefs or whoever is coordinating their food, uh, part of that um, business or, you know, organization, mm -hmm. isn't going to go shopping at a farmer's market, <clears throat> isn't necessarily going to take the time to by direct from a farm. They want to call they want to call the the you know the middleman produce guy and be like, "Hey, I need your order guide. I need three boxes of zucchini. I need a, you know, 50 pounds bag of potatoes. I need so many bags of onions." You know what I mean? And they're going to they're going to have it show up on, on a pallet because that's what's efficient and that's what's affordable. Because yeah. they have a bottom line to meet too. And so when I say that, you know, there's always going to be that consumer who buys more expensive cheese and more expensive wine and better shoes, like, like that is true within every aspect of what we buy. It's true for cars. It's true for clothes. It's true for our food. And so supporting whatever you want to support is a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing that we have those choices. And so I don't... Um, I don't like that. I don't like that that we, even within agriculture, you know, everybody kind of goes, "Oh, well, they do this and they do that," you know, and it's like, "Oh, stop, stop, stop," because it shouldn't. It should never be an us and a them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it should be the us and them should actually be we are in agriculture, and there. Are people out there who don't like us and while we're mm. busy fighting amongst ourselves which I don't think we fight amongst ourselves too much but but while we're busy like nitpicking each other there's this whole other entity out here that is like trying to attack us as a whole you know what, so I mean? what, what is that attack how well who are, who are these people what's their motive oh I don't know exactly who they are but <laughs> but just generally <clears throat> yeah yeah but I mean but there's groups out there that you know that are trying to undermine the work of local agriculture. They're trying, you know, I mean, I look at regulation, like look at, look at, um, look at carbon taxes that are just gonna make it super expensive for farms to be able to operate their machinery. We had a group of leadership people who came up from California last summer who were ooing and aahing at our little tractors because we have little tractors with implements that are set up for everything. So you have one that's set up to cultivate beets, one set up for leeks, one set up for zucchini. And they're all these little small kind of old, you know, mm -hmm. first generation. We're back to that whole thing, right? But they're, um, they all have this purpose. And these guys from California were like, wow, this is so cool. Like, you, couldn't, you can't operate these kind of tractors on our farms. Because Why? they there's too many too much emissions like they can't they can't utilize older equipment because the regulations are too strict. So they have to get new. They have to get new, and it has to meet these you know emission requirements. And so when we when you think about how hard it is for a new farmer to get into 
agric or a new farmer to get started or anybody to get started, right? Mm -hmm. So what are those barriers? Well, equipment, new yeah. equipment's expensive. So when you think about, you know, an older piece of equipment that you can make use of to just get going, like, you know, yeah. so are we setting ourselves up for failure by having these regulatory issues be so strict that we aren't growing our our agriculturalist industry. yeah so yeah you go instead of going from that old tractor carbon footprint to a newer tractor carbon footprint you're going to you know food from mexico carbon footprint or food from <laughs> which we have yeah. no control of so i'm just saying yeah it's like apples and oranges on scale if you're really worried about what the the footprint carbon footprint of your food is i don't know i obviously i'm biased on this that's why i'm doing all this but to me advantage local food times 10 right mm -hmm. here I, even if the tractor isn't the most efficient and it won't last forever anyway eventually it will have to be replaced by that more efficient tractor but even if its carbon footprint is a little bit bigger mm -hmm. it's so much more important to have that food grown locally mm -hmm than have a truck or a train or a ship bring it thousands of miles here. Absolutely, and and the older tractors, typically you can work on those easier, right? Oh, yeah. You don't have the whole right to repair issue. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know, like I, I think too about uh, when it comes to food safety regulations and, and like we control what we grow here, right? We, our farm, we're responsible, we do third party audits, we have this whole food safety thing <laughs> that mm -hmm. takes a tremendous amount of time and paperwork and effort to track and uh, yearly audits that we uh, go through. And so we, um, we adhere to that and we're proud to do that and we're proud to grow safe food here when we are bringing food in from another country, we, we can't control what they're doing in another country. And they may say, oh yeah, no, we do it this way. Oh yeah, check the boxes, whatever. But are they really, like, do they really? I don't know. So the question is what, what food can you really trust? I don't know, I'd rather eat something from here than anywhere else. So, I mean, I think, don't they still put alar on grapes and chili or something like really? that? I don't know. Somebody told me that. Yeah. So we'd have to check that factoid out. But but yet we we don't do that on apples here. And everybody had this big, huge thing. But then we're happy to eat grapes grown in chili that are imported here. And so just because something isn't um, approved to use in the United States, doesn't like as long as it's not happening in my backyard, if it's happening in another country, I'm not going to care. Yeah. Which doesn't really make sense at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's about the food that you're putting in your body. Right. And look at, I mean, look at farms and, and that spread manure, like there's regulation on that. Don't ask me what it is, but there is mm -hmm. like you can only spread certain times a year and you can only spread so much per acre and I mean. To protect the streams and sure. things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so, not, yeah, it's not as simple as just, yeah, go throw some manure out there. Yeah. <laughs> so I know that from having grown up around dairy farms. Yeah. And still living in a dairy farming community. I heard a statistic the other day that kind of blew me away. 7% of American adults believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Is that true? <laughs> really? That's a, when you think about um, when our... Yeah, when you think about it, it blows you away, but when you actually put the number that that's like over 16 million Americans. That's, that's a, scary. That's a problem. That's scary. But the same, here's another good one for you. Those so, adults or those kids? No, these are adults. It said adults. So oh, um, the other good one that, that my good friend April Clayton loves to share is uh, that the number of farmers in the United States is the same um number of people who believe in aliens that's a i love that statistic it's brilliant it's like like a little over one percent or something are you saying that farmers believe in aliens no i'm saying that no i know I'm yeah, just yeah. 
Um, that is how small that right. farming community has become. Yeah. And when you think about it, when you define that 1%, like half of them, I think it's half of them, really gross, like $10,000 a year or something like that. So, I mean, when you, when you think about the ones who are actually in production, yeah, living off of it. Yeah, grossing ten thousand dollars a year. You back yeah. all the costs out, and your profits maybe what a hundred yeah. bucks. <laughs> so it's like a Schedule H or something. They yeah. file for their taxes. So um, I, I don't know. I think especially with our current situation and coronavirus, and when you're looking at uh, empty shelves, and people should be asking more questions. They should be saying, "Hey, I want to see local. I don't just want to see the poster hanging." You know, in the yeah. store, I want to see you, you know, actually, like, it's not just a marketing tool. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like that poster is a marketing tool as a farmer. So back to the, the farm stand thing, though, you don't do that anymore. No, no. And um, we had the intention of building a new one uh, with a partner right next to the freeway where our pumpkin patch is. But oh my gosh, it just, the cost of doing it uh, within the city was just turned into an astronomical, like, oh my gosh, I, I came home one day and I said to Burr, hey, so this whole retail thing is in my lap. And I have one question. I go, do you like that your wife is home when you get home from work? And he said, well, yeah. And I go, if we do this, I, I'll never be home when you get home from work because we're gonna be in, a, in this new hole we're gonna create for 20 years probably. And I mean, I don't know, like we're just at the point where, uh, you know, trying to get our farm set up for a second generation. We have a 25 year old and a 22 year old and then Lily's 13, almost 14 and, um, and a 12 year old and, and everybody's working on the farm and so it's like, you know, we need to be figuring out what our next step is and how we become more efficient on the farm. And I, I don't know, I just, we decided adding something new like that was going to be a lot. And the one that you had couldn't keep going? Well, we would still have to put in this new well and water treatment system. And that's mm. before you even apply for a risk one grocery permit. So that is to carry anything with an expiration date. So you're not cutting anything. Even you're something not. that's just grown on the farm here? Yeah, but but then you're just doing produce and the money really is, it's all those other things. It's yeah. the guy who like comes by and he picks up corn and a 22 ounce, you know, micro brew and, right. and it's the cheese and picking up a bottle of wine and well we and like you were saying earlier having a variety of things your own stuff and then other stuff so people can mm -hmm. and so then that puts you kind of in a different category as far as the rules you have to follow well anything refrigerated with an expiration date so if you're talking um cheese pa package stuff yeah, yeah totally and so what would it take to do all that to be able to about seventy-five thousand dollars and drilling really? a well and getting a water treatment system in and even though this is crazy so if you have a distillery like people want a natural water source right water spring that's like awesome well we have a natural water spring but you can't that's not good enough for this store situation mm. like we would have to drill a well and even though you already have a natural yeah. water source oh yeah and the water's tested because you know we we're a farm. We have all of our water tested. It's part of our food safety program. Mm. So just, I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example of regulatory inconsistency where you have one agency that's like, oh, hey, no, this is cool. Like, you're good. And then you have another agency that's like, oh, no, we require this. Yeah, it's dumb. Maybe we'll go back to it at some point. But at the time, um, going into the time that that was, I mean, it was it, it was a tough, it's, there's been some pretty lean years on the farm in the last few years, especially when you're dealing with, you know, you can grow cucumbers and beets, but when, this is the thing about exporting, right? We can export, but you can't just export, you have to import too. <laughs> Part of the problem with that is that you have cheap cucumbers or cheap, beets that come into your 
your area and under, I mean, you guys see it in Whatcom with berries. Well, it happens yeah. with vegetables too. And so when you're, you can't compete with that when mm-hmm. our wages are, are, are way bigger than mm-hmm. what they make there. And so they can grow that product for less. And, and when they're kind of flooding your market with cheap product and it's like, eh, okay, great. It's not, not a fair level playing field. Mm-mm. No, and they mm. certainly aren't living in your zip code to know what your expenses are. And so I think we figured out that um, in the last four years, minimum wage has gone up, four or five years, that minimum wage has gone up uh, like a little over $4. And our produce has either gone down or gone up at the most a buck. So like when you think about that, okay, so when, when minimum wage goes up, and we pay more than minimum wage, Mm-hmm. on our farm because we're in South King County you compete with warehouses yeah. you can you know what I mean we have to um and in the past we've paid like a bonus per hour bonus if you stay all season because we're trying to get people to stay all season and so when you um when you think about like wages are going up okay well they don't just go up for us they go up for everybody so you have they go up for the propane people and the fertilizer people and the the seed guys and the mechanic guy and our tire guy and you know what I mean everybody goes up so things become more expensive your labor becomes more expensive and if your if your box price for your produce stays the same or goes up 25 cents or goes down which we had that happen like why doesn't that go up then too because there are people buying stuff in the store should have more money to spend that kind of because it we're price takers not price makers and so you got back to the guy in cincinnati his job right and if you have somebody else who'll sell it for less and he's selling volume right then he's like gonna say oh, okay fine i'll sell it for that because you have a buyer who's just you know oh this guy will sell it for whatever and you know, and the farmers don't talk to each other enough, and they need to be. You can't set prices, but you need to be talking to each other more, and you need, you know, just so that it's like, hey, you know, I'm going up, period. Like, we should all go up, so. What what does the future hold for you and for this farm? Well, um, like I said, we're we're um, trying to get to the second generation. Uh, we're trying Any to. Are your kids interested in? Oh yeah, so there's it on? there's discussion. You know, we have first first generation growing pains, right? So mm-hmm. we have dad who's you know I've been doing it this way, and this is a forty <laughs> plus year old farm, and you know, so yep. he has his very you know way of thinking, and then you have younger um, younger people who, because they're adults now, I can't call them kids, right, uh, who are, are trying to think out of the box and, well, hey, we sh- maybe we should try this or maybe we should try that. And and my son, Casey, he's 22, and he, I mean, they've all worked on the farm since they were 12. And yeah. Casey's worked on pretty much every crew, and, like, he was 17 and putting in 100 hours on an irrigation crew and you know, loving these big paychecks and his buddies are like, wow, man, I want to work on the farm. And he's like, you can't because I can because I'm the family. family. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. you can't. That would be child labor. Mm. Right. And uh, so, um, you know, we're we're trying to wait and see how it all plays out. And there's a lot happening right now. There's a lot happening. Yeah. It's uh, interesting times. And um, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out and how the regulatory end of um agriculture stuff how where that heads right yeah and uh so i don't know like it's like that book we talked about right who moved my cheese our cheese might move a little bit we have to figure (laughs) out where it went and uh um as far as me personally, I, um, I'm going to keep advocating for agriculture. I think it's our uh, most valuable industry. You can't work or uh, put food on your table or 
clothes on your back or a roof over your head without food in your belly. That's where it all begins. And so if we don't recognize that as a society, we have a big problem. And um, so that's that's my goal. I'm I am trying to figure out how to work smarter and not harder in that department. And uh, school this inter is going to be interesting this fall, and we're going to take a little bit different direction there. And so that's going to impact my time. And so I'm yeah. I'm figuring out like what boards to drop and what commitments that I need to figure out how to get out of yeah. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. And the um, shifts caused by COVID in our lives, right? Yeah. 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 And I think that uh, I think that applies to a lot of industries and you know, but at the end of the day we're I mean, we're still here and we're still growing food and um, our kids, uh, we've been packing USDA farm to families boxes. And so like Lily and Henry, so they're 12 and 14, almost 14. And uh, they've been putting together boxes for us to pack and they have a thousand boxes. So today is Thursday and we'll pack again on Monday and they'll, you know, put together a thousand boxes for that project. And wow. And then they'll have two days to put together a thousand more boxes and, and they're getting, you know, they're getting paid to do that. And, and it's, um, it will go down as a memory for them. And, you know, we all have perspective changers, right? I think my first big one was losing my dad at 20 and yeah. going through that experience. And, and I think these guys are having their first real perspective changer in their life where they're like, wow, you know, we, We've had some really interesting conversations about food and food security. And when your 12 year old son is like, wow, do you know, there's a reason we have freezers and I would get it. <laughs> like, there's a reason you actually like put stuff in the freezer. And cause when you can't get, when you can't get something at the store, uh, that's a scary prospect. And, and we are blessed and lucky to be able to do that. And, you know, you think about families and, and little tiny apartments that are pretty stuck in there and can't, especially Auburn is <clears throat> one of the least healthy cities in the state of Auburn and so, or in the state of Washington. And so when you, when you think about how families in a town with 30 different languages spoken and, and I'm sure there's a lot of <clears throat> food security issues, uh, those are things that, that we care about on the farm and we, we try to be a positive impact in our local community. So I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be interesting going forward to see how it all plays out. Thanks for sharing your story and keeping this farm going. Oh, absolutely, Dylan. I'm I mean, glad that, glad you finally got it, here, it, man. It's yeah, and I know we've been talking about having this conversation for a long time, but what you guys do here is pretty cool because, especially in my mind, because of how close you are to the big city, um, and how much different local food. You guys grow i mean that list at the beginning was even though you said it's shrunk it was still a pretty long list in my mind i come from a farm where we did one thing yeah. red raspberries so that's cool to hear about all that we couldn't do it without our team and we um i say it often we can sign our name on the dotted line right but it takes a crew to make it all happen and we are lucky to have a three generation family that works on this first generation farm and and it it is a farm family for sure and we have mm -hmm. huge respect for them and and vice versa and we we all work together for that common goal of of being successful every year we try hard doesn't always work but we try hard <laughs>